Hello everyone, and welcome back to another video. Today's video is going to be on turkeys. The turkey is a large bird, which is native to the Americas. People normally think of the white feathered turkeys seen on Thanksgiving. But how well do you really know Maligris Galopavo, the wild turkey from which the domesticated version was derived. The earliest turkeys evolved in North America over 20 million years ago and belong to the order of galliforms. These are heavy-bodied, ground-feeding birds that includes turkey, grouse, chicken, New World quail, and Old World quail, ptarmigan, partridge, pheasant, guinea fowl, francolin, jungle fowl, pea fowl or peacock, and the Cressidae. The full turkey taxonomy reads as follows. They belong to the kingdom Animalia, the phylum Chordata, the class Avis, the order Galliforms, the family Phasianidae, the subfamily Malagrinidae, probably saying that wrong, and the genus Maligris. The species Maligris gallopavo, Maligris ocellata, and Maligris californica. Maligris californica, the California turkey, became extinct recently enough to have been hunted by early human settlers. It has been suggested that its demise was due to the combined pressures of human hunting and climate change at the end of the last glacial period. Now, keep in mind, turkeys are more than just big chickens. More than 45 million years of evolution separates the two species. As mentioned before, there are two extant species of turkeys. One is the Maligris gallopavo, which lives in the forest of North America from Mexico, where they were first domesticated by the Mayans, throughout the Midwest and eastern United States, and into southeastern Canada. The other is Maligris ocellata, the ocellated turkey, who lives in the forest of the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. The wild turkey was hunted nearly to extinction by the early 1900s, when the population reached a low of around 30,000 birds, but restoration programs across North America have brought the numbers up to 7 million today. There are six subspecies of wild turkey, all native to North America. The pilgrims hunted and ate the eastern wild turkey Maligris gallopavo sylvestris, which today has a range that covers the eastern half of the United States and extends into Canada. These birds, sometimes called the forest turkey, are the most numerous of all the turkey subspecies, numbering more than 5 million. The Aztecs domesticated another subspecies, Maligris Galopavo Galopavo, the South Mexican wild turkey, and the Spanish brought those turkeys to Europe. The pilgrims then brought several of these domestic turkeys back to North America. And how did turkeys get their name? Well, turkeys were domesticated in ancient Mexico for food and for their cultural and symbolic significance. The Aztecs, for example, had a name for the turkey. 
Guajolote in Spanish, a word still used in modern Mexico in addition to the general term pavo. Spanish chroniclers, including Bernal Diaz del Castillo and Father Bernardino de Sayagun, describe the multitude of food both raw fruits and vegetables, as well as prepared dishes that were offered in the vast markets of Tenochtitlan, noting there were tamales made of turkey, iguana, chocolate, fruits, vegetables, and more. The ancient people of Mexico had not only domesticated the turkey, but had apparently developed sophisticated recipes including these ingredients over hundreds of years. There are two theories for the derivation of the name Turkey, both of which may be correct. According to Columbia University professor of Romance Languages, Mario Pei, one theory is that when Europeans first encountered turkeys in America, they incorrectly identified the birds as a type of guinea fowl, which were already being imported into Europe by Turkey merchants via Constantinople and were therefore named turkey cocks. The name of the North American bird thus became turkey fowl or Indian turkeys, which was then shortened to just turkeys. A second theory arises from turkeys coming to England, not directly from the Americas, but via merchant ships from the Middle East, where they were domesticated successfully. Again, the importers lent the name to the bird Middle Eastern merchants were called Turkey merchants, because much of that area was part of the Ottoman Empire. Hence the name Turkey Cocks and Turkey Hens, and soon thereafter, Turkeys. Other languages have other names for turkeys. Many of these incorporate an assumed Indian origin, such as Dinde, from India in French, India Yushka, Bird of India in Russian, Indic in Polish and Ukrainian, and Hindi, India in Turkish. These are thought to arise from the supposed belief of Christopher Columbus that he had reached India rather than the Americas on his voyage. In Portuguese, a turkey is a Peru. The name is thought to derive from the eponymous country, Peru. Now, a little bit of information on the body and anatomy of the turkey. Male turkeys are sometimes called toms, but are better known as gobblers, after the gobble call that they make to announce themselves to females and to compete with other males. Female turkeys are called hens, and juvenile males are referred to as jakes. Jakes can be distinguished by the four to six central feathers on their tail fans that are longer than the rest. Turkeys have a cloaca, a small vent or slit which leads to the turkey's sex organs. Interestingly, a turkey's droppings can determine if they're male or female. Males produce spiral shaped poops and females poops look like the letter J. <laughs> An adult gobbler weighs 16 to 22 pounds on average, has a beard of modified feathers on his breast that reaches 7 inches or more long, and has sharp spurs on his legs for fighting. A hen is smaller, weighing around 8 to 12 pounds, and has no beard or spurs. There are also marked differences in the appearance of male and female adult turkeys. In most turkey strains, only males have a beard, a modified feather in the upper chest area that grows continuously around 3 to 5 inches per year. Similarly, male turkeys have spurs like roosters, although there have been isolated cases of hens with spurs. Hens have more feathers on the backs of their necks, while Tom's necks are mostly bare. Color of a Tom's head and neck change with the onset of the breeding season, from a vibrant red on the caruncles, white 
on the crown of the head and blue on the neck and side of the face during the breeding season to a more subdued red and blue for the rest of the year. Hens do not change their coloration with the season, retaining a bluish-gray head and light pink caruncles year-round. Wild turkeys are generally thought to have a lifespan of 10 to 13 years, although few wild birds live out their full potential lifespan. Turkeys possess specialized sensory abilities to help them negotiate their environment and avoid predators. They are known to have excellent eyesight and hearing. Turkeys have color vision, high visual acuity, and a 300 degree field of vision. They have a well-developed ability to discriminate between frequencies and to ascertain where sound is coming from. Their sense of smell, however, may be less well-developed as they possess relatively small olfactory lobes. Every adult turkey possesses caruncles, a snood, and a dewlap. In anatomical terms, the snood is an erectile fleshy protuberance on the forehead of turkeys. The snood can be between one to six inches in length depending on the turkeys sex, health, and mood. Snoods are just one of the caruncles that can be found on turkeys. Caruncles are small fleshy bulbs at the base of the neck. The dewlap is a thin piece of skin that stretches under the throat. Domesticated turkeys often peck and pull at the snood, causing damage and bleeding. This often leads to a further injurious pecking by other turkeys and sometimes results in cannibalism. To prevent this, some farmers cut off the snood when the chick is young, a process known as desnooding. This has a serious impact on turkeys because the snood functions in both intersexual and intrasexual selection. Captive female wild turkeys prefer to mate with long-snooted males, and during dyadic interactions, male turkeys defer to males with relatively longer snoods. These results were demonstrated using both live males and controlled artificial models of males. Data on the parasite burdens of free-living wild turkeys revealed a negative correlation between snood length and infection with intestinal coccidia parasites. This indicates that in the wild, the long-snooded males preferred by females and avoided by males seem to be resistant to coccidial infection. And what do turkeys eat? Well, Wild turkeys eat plant matter that they forage for in flocks, mostly on the ground, but sometimes climbing into shrubs or low trees for fruits. Baby turkeys, called poults, eat berries, seeds, and insects, while adults have a more varied diet that can include acorns and even small reptiles. In fall, winter, and early spring, They scratch the forest floor for acorns from red oak, white oak, chestnut oak, and black oak, along with American beech nuts, pecans, hickory nuts, wild black cherries, white ash seeds, and other seeds and berries. When deep snow covers the ground, they eat hemlock buds, evergreen ferns, spore-covered fronds of sensitive ferns, club mosses, and burdock. During the spring, they may dig up plant bulbs if nuts are scarce. In late spring and summer, wild turkeys strip seeds from sedges and grasses, occasionally supplementing their plant diet with salamanders, snails, ground beetles, and other insects. 
Like most birds, they swallow grit to help digest their food. Turkeys may be found roosting near water sources. However, moisture from morning dew, small pools, or succulent insects, fruits, and vegetation often meet their required water intake. Turkeys are incredibly hardy, able to withstand periods of little food intake in inclement weather. Undernourished turkeys are rarely observed, and when they are found, it is usually during periods of extended snowfall or when they are struck with disease or injury. During periods of significant snow, turkeys generally remain in their roosting trees for days at a time, eating only buds and small amounts of snow. They have also been observed taking advantage of holes in the snow dug by foraging deer, often supplanting the unsuspecting deer and laying claim to the newly uncovered food. Turkeys tend to swallow their food whole with soft foods traversing the entire digestive system quickly. Hard foods, however, remain in the gizzard or muscular stomach where grinding occurs before processing through the digestive system. Where a turkey lives greatly impacts what they eat. Wild turkeys live year-round in open forest with interspersed clearings in 49 states, in parts of Mexico, and parts of southern Alberta, Ontario, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan, Canada. I probably said that wrong. <laughs> Turkeys in northeastern North America use mature oak hickory forest and humid forest of red oak, beech, cherry, and white ash. In the southeast, turkeys live in forest containing pine, magnolia, beech, live oak, pecan, American elm, cedar elm, cottonwood, hickory, bald cypress, tapello, sweet gum, or water ash, with understories of sourwood, huckleberry, blueberry, mountain laurel, green briar, rose, wisteria, buttonbush, or Carolina willow. Southwestern birds are often found in open grassy savanna with small oak species. In Alberta, turkeys live between pinyon juniper forest and ponderosa pine forest. What I didn't know is that turkeys, like chickens, are very social animals. They spend their days playing with their siblings and with their mother. The mother guards them and teaches them survival skills. Poults, baby turkeys, stay with their mothers until the next breeding season. Researchers have found that when an individual turkey was removed from his or her group, even for a short time, he or she became obviously distressed and immediately began vocalizing, which persisted until they were replaced in the group. Wild turkeys get around mostly by walking, although they can also run and fly when threatened. Females tend to fly while males tend to run, and adult turkeys can run at speeds of 10 to 20 miles per hour and fly in short bursts at 55 miles per hour. Wild turkeys are diurnal, active only during the day. After feeding and exploring, turkeys engage in a long period of relative inactivity, interspersed with bouts of preening, dusting, and resting. Several hours before sunset, feeding resumes, and shortly before nightfall, flocks faithfully return to their trees for the night, preferring the cover of thick forest. In large feeding groups, individual turkeys take turns scanning the horizon for predators every few seconds, 
resulting in a highly vigilant flock. However, wild turkeys rarely desert their home range even when it is interfered with due to hunting, logging, or agricultural activities. They simply adjust their movements to avoid human contact. They usually roost in flocks, but sometimes they roost individually. Males breed with multiple mates and form all-male flocks outside of the breeding season, leaving the poult rearing to the females. The poults travel in a family group with their mother, often combining with other family groups to form large flocks of young turkeys accompanied by two or more adult females. Each sex has an independent pecking order with a stable female hierarchy and a constantly changing male hierarchy. Birds fight for dominance, recognizing individuals within the pecking order while sharing overlapping home ranges. Aggressive interactions can be observed among juveniles beginning at about three months of age reaching a peak at five months as hierarchies become established. Male turkeys tend to fight more forcefully than females. Interestingly, a subordinate hen can often be identified by her neck. This is because dominant females often peck subordinates. Therefore, a largely bare neck reflects a hen's low social rank. Poor girl. Wild turkeys are hunted by coyotes, bobcats, raccoons, mountain lions, golden eagles, great horned owls, and of course, people. Their nest predators include raccoons, possums, striped skunks, gray foxes, woodchucks, rat snakes, bull snakes, birds, and rodents. Turkeys also demonstrate a variety of vocalizations. Although silence is the norm for poults, since the first few weeks of a turkey's life are particularly dangerous. Researchers have observed the use of three kinds of yelps, a tree yelp, plain yelp, and plain lost call. Two basic calls the cluck and the alarm butt. The cluck and the alarm butt. And several complex calls, the kiki, the cackle, and the gobble. The tree yelp is often the first sound made by turkeys in the morning and is thought to be a sort of greeting. The plain yelp may be used while still in the roost or at other times during the day. It is a louder yelp that may serve to call birds together if they have strayed too far from the flock. The plain lost call is very similar to the plain yelp, but often louder and more urgent sounding, and is thought to gather a family group together. One of the two basic calls, the cluck, is often used to get the attention of a particular turkey or to establish the position of other turkeys. When the alarm putt is used, every bird looks up with a sense of apprehension. Young, lost turkeys have been heard uttering the kiki call, kiki call, <laughs> which often sounds like a whine, a whistle, or a squeal. The cackle is most often heard as turkeys are entering or leaving the roost, and a hen will often use it to implore her brood to follow her out of the tree. The gobble is a well-known turkey vocalization, most often associated with toms during the mating season, but also used in the early mornings or when males are frightened or hear other males gobbling. Other sounds include the pit-pit, a purr sound characteristic of a contented flock, and the drum, 
made by males during their breeding displays. Turkeys are competent learners on a number of cognitive tasks. Wild turkeys have exhibited the ability to remember very precise locations. In some instances, they have returned to a location a mile away at the exact time that they were lured there the day before. Hens have also shown the ability to remember a location they have visited only once. If a hen lays her eggs under thick cover in an area she has never been to before, she will unfailingly return to it the following day at the precise moment necessary to continue laying eggs in her nest. With all of that intelligence does come some aggression. Now, I have personally encountered a not-so-friendly turkey at a sanctuary. I just decided to leave him alone. But I didn't know that turkeys are actually known to be aggressive towards humans and pets in residential areas. I thought the turkey just didn't like me. <laughs> but wild, habituated turkeys may respond to humans and animals as they do to another turkey. Habituated turkeys may attempt to dominate or attack people that the birds view as subordinates. Well, I guess that turkey thought I was subordinate. That's okay. The town of Brookline, Massachusetts recommends that citizens be aggressive towards the turkeys take a step towards them and not back down. Brookline officials have also recommended making noise, like clanging pots or other objects together, popping open an umbrella, shouting and waving your arms, and squirting them with a hose. I'm not too crazy about that one. You can even allow your leashed dog to bark at them and forcefully fend them off with a broom. I'm a little bit amused by the thought of people behaving like this, but I guess, you know, turkeys are a little bit scary when you're face to face with them. And now for some information on how we get more and more turkeys, also known as reproduction. <laughs> Now, turkeys raised for meat in factory farms grow so big that they usually are unable to breed naturally. Instead, farmers artificially inseminate them. So, it's no wonder that many people don't know how turkeys reproduce. But, for wild turkeys, there are different breeding seasons. Breeding behavior is triggered primarily by the increasing day length in spring and subsequent hormonal response. Unusually warm or cold spells may accelerate or slow breeding activity slightly. And so it goes, the male turkeys start loudly gobbling to attract the females. Once the females come around, the males fan out their tail feathers and raise their body feathers while they dance around. Their dancing display is meant to entice the females to mate with them. Turkeys are polygamous, meaning they will mate with multiple partners. If the female turkey is receptive to his advances, she will lower herself in front of the male. The actual mating involves them placing their cloacas together to transfer the sperm. The dominant males get to do most of the mating, but the other males have opportunities to reproduce as well. Hens will then prepare for the chick's arrival. Hens can also reproduce through parthenogenesis, a process by which viable eggs are produced despite the hen having never mated. Although the number of these embryos that are viable enough to hatch are very low, on the rare occasions when they do hatch successfully, the hatchlings are always male. And I've always loved that word parthenogenesis. It makes me think of the song Nemesis by Shriek Back. 
Comment if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> anyway, back to the turkeys. So when the hens are preparing to lay the eggs, they'll become secretive while searching for a site to nest. The nests are shallow depressions formed by scratching, squatting, and laying eggs. Moderate, dense understory is preferred to allow hens a view, but also provide protection. Hens lay between 10 to 12 eggs during a two-week period. The eggs are a pale yellowish tan color with evenly marked reddish or pinkish spots. Continuous incubation begins when the last egg is laid. The hen will only leave for a short period to feed and may remain on the nest for several consecutive days. Eggs will be incubated for 26 to 28 days. The hen sits quietly and moves about once an hour to turn and reposition the eggs, allowing them to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide. This is also thought to prevent the developing poult from becoming attached to one side of the egg. And when the poults are born, the hatching begins with pipping. Not sure if I'm saying that right. But it's when the poult rotates within the shell, chipping a complete break around the large end of the egg. Hens will begin to make soft clucks in response at random to begin to imprint the baby birds. Imprinting is a special form of learning which facilitates the rapid social development of the poults into adults. Damp poults free themselves but dry fully so they can follow the hen away from the nest within 12 to 24 hours after hatching. And here's a little timeline for developing poults behavior. So, day-old poults learn to respond to the hen's putt or alarm call before leaving the nest and will respond by freezing or running to hide beneath the hen if she sounds the alarm call. Within hours, poults learn to peck at food items by mimicking their mother's behavior. On day two, Poults are performing most of the characteristic feeding, movement, and grooming behavior patterns. By week one, poults are regularly dusting with the hen. By week two, poults are able to fly short distances. Unlike factory farm turkeys who are unable to fly because of overgrowth from growth hormones, wild turkeys can and do fly. By week three, Poults can roost in low trees with the hen, and this change also indicates a change of diet from mostly insects to a higher percentage of plant matter. Through week six, poults that survive at this age have a much better chance of surviving to adulthood. By 14 weeks, male and female poults are distinguishable by body size and plumage. By fall, the pecking order of the sibling groups has been established and the young flocks are ready to enter the social organization of the surrounding population. Almost sounds like high school. <laughs> the safety strategies for them include a variety of behaviors. During their daily activities, poults will promptly scatter if the hen senses danger and vocalizes to them. Their strategy is to disperse and freeze, allowing their mother to perform her cripple act, which serves to distract the intruder. If her loud and blustering performance does not drive off the interloper, she will keep contact with her pults from a distance, all the while they remain frozen, often for as long as 30 minutes. The poult's defensive strategy changes with age. Once they are 10 days old, they scatter over greater distance and are practically impossible to catch by hand. Juvenile turkeys molt several times before they develop the plumage necessary to survive the winter. 
The natal down is replaced during the first molt, called the postnatal molt, which is complete after six weeks, except on the head and the neck. The post-juvenile, or second molt, begins after four weeks and is nearly complete at 14 weeks of age. At the 15th week, the third, or first winter molt, begins when the two pairs of central tail feathers are dropped. Adults molt only once per year beginning in the spring, usually following the mating season. Body growth of juveniles ends by the beginning of winter. And to wrap it up, I'd like to talk about turkey conservation. Wild turkeys are numerous, and their populations increased sharply between 1966 and 2014, according to the North American Breeding Survey. Partners in Flight estimates a global breeding population of 7.8 million, with about 89% living in the U.S., 10% in Mexico, and 2% in Canada. They rate as 7 out of 20 on the Continental Concern score and are not in the 2014 State of the Birds watch list. Wild turkeys regained and even expanded their range after drastic declines during the 19th and early 20th centuries from hunting and habitat loss. One subspecies disappeared from New England in the mid-19th century, surviving in small numbers in wilderness areas of the Gulf States, the Ozarks, and the Appalachian and Cumberland Plateaus. Another subspecies disappeared from parts of Texas, while yet another declined precipitously in numbers throughout the Southwest. In the early 20th century, people tried unsuccessfully to use farm turkeys to restore wild populations. But in the late 1940s, they began to successfully transplant wild-caught turkeys into suitable habitat. No other free-living bird has responded so well to the efforts of so-called game managers. The birds are popular among hunters. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service estimates 21% of all U.S. hunters, about 2.5 million people, pursue the turkey, making it the second most hunted animal after deer. Their expanding populations have made it possible for hunting seasons to be put in place in all 49 states in their range, meaning that it's legal to kill them, unfortunately. Wild turkeys are birds with considerable adaptive abilities enhancing their survival in a wide range of environments. They exhibit complex patterns of behavior, an array of communication signals, vivid plumage, an elaborate courtship, strong social ties, and have a protective maternal nature. Their ability to reproduce by parthenogenesis is a fascinating rarity. Their ability to return to an exact location at a precise time after considerable time has passed is evidence of hitherto unappreciated intelligence. Further study of the behavior and cognition of domestic and wild turkeys is warranted to better understand and appreciate these birds. If you have a large yard near woods, you can attract wild turkeys by planting nut-bearing or berry trees. Some people attract turkeys by scattering bird seed or corn on their lawns. Just be aware that this can also attract unwanted visitors such as rodents. You can find out more about what to feed wild turkeys by using the Project Feeder Watch Common Feeder Birds Bird List. With that being said, an ethical vegan lifestyle respects these birds' right to live unharmed by human interference. If you are not vegan, I truly hope that you will consider the importance and uniqueness of these birds. They have every much a right to live as you do.